Welcome to the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. I'm your host, Kate Powell. In a world where humans who feel vibrant, whole, and fully alive seem to be increasingly rare, where burnout and brokenness seem to be increasingly the norm, both in individuals and our larger ecosystems, it seems worth exploring how did we get here? And more importantly, what perspectives or what cultural practices or what spiritual, ancestral, or animist wisdom processes might help us stay true to the spark and rhythm of our aliveness on this wild, heartbreaking, but ultimately rare and precious life. Thank you for being here. May these conversations help us to stay human in the face of dehumanizing forces. May they nourish our wild, tender hearts, and may they plant seeds which flourish into a more regenerative and vibrant future. Hey, Kate here with Wild Sacred Journey. So I think it might be time to talk about, well, so this episode will come out on the full moon, which is also a partial lunar eclipse and is also close to the autumn equinox. So there's a lot of like themes around light and dark and, um, as I said that I heard the heron croaking which the herons, because of how they stand kind of right at the border of um, the water and the, you know, they inhabit those liminal spaces right at the border of land and water. And they kind of look like stooped old, um, but graceful and wise kind of creatures. So they often can be quite associated in myth and story, cranes and herons and things like that with um, with those liminal spaces, storks with birth, but cranes and herons more with kind of death portals. So yeah, so in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, so we have this big, um, yeah, this full moon, this lunar eclipse, and then also, you know, the Northern Hemisphere, this autumn equinox. And so we're moving into the darker part of the year. And, you know, all of our long ago ancestors from everywhere in the world seem to have some sort of story about the solar eclipses and the lunar eclipses. And some were sort of more about like fear, maybe, of it happening, um, hard to tell if that's true to the people at the time or if that's our interpretation of it now, um, because we live in a quite death phobic culture. Some, you know, were more maybe celebration. Some were more just honoring that this was like a moment. The skies seemed to be showing us that it was a moment to like pause and really reflect on light and dark um, and, you know, to, to commit to, to honoring aliveness in some kind of way. So this seems like a perfect time to talk about shadow work and burnout. So shadow work is just kind of a fancy term for tending the parts of ourselves that have been relegated to the edges. So, you know, in the work that I do, um, you know, my teachers called it an aspect retrieval. I've heard other people call it a soul retrieval, but you know, there are moments in our life, most of us have gone through at least one of them where there was something pure and innocent in us that it didn't feel safe to be, or that we received some kind of feedback from adults or trusted guides and peers in our life that it wasn't okay to be. We Maybe we were mocked or maybe we were hurt for being that way. And So we sent that part of us to live outside of us. And now every time we try to access that part of us, first we have to kind of go through, it's almost like this wilderness, you know, of all the reasons, the scary, dark wilderness of all the reasons that we sent it to live outside of us in the first place. And so we assume that that thing itself is bad or scary because the path to get back to it is scary. And more importantly, it was actually scary for a very young version of us because the adult us wouldn't necessarily be scared of it. But the young version of us that we were at the time that we sent that part to live outside of us would be scared. And so because we sent it to live outside in that moment, at that age, there's an energy in us that's frozen in that time. And so, you know, part of why then sometimes we can be in a space where we feel like, why am I suddenly acting you know, like a six-year-old, like why my adult self wouldn't be bothered by this? Like, why am I freaking out? And it's like, oh, maybe that's some of what's going on. So it might be that. It might also be the image of, you know, there's that trope in movies and stuff of like, 
where, you know, someone's sitting around a fire and they see this menacing shadow approaching from around a rock and it's terrifying and they're imagining some big terrifying creature and then it turns out it's like a cute little bug or like an adorable little kitten or, you know, whatever, right? So that's kind of a perfect metaphor for what shadow work is in some ways because usually what happens in shadow work is that we've built it up to be something in our minds and we lean really heavy on it and we think it's going to be this dark terrifying thing and we think we the part of us that we've sent to live on the edges is this dark terrifying thing this thing that we should be so ashamed to be or to have done at one point in time or whatever right and you know there's a reason that we feel those things and it may be that we were out of integrity or out of alignment in some way in some kind of an action or that there's a pattern that we inherited um, or picked up or put into place as a coping pattern, as a survival pattern somewhere along the way that maybe does actually hurt us and other people, although it was our best chance at survival at the time, right? So there might be some scary, heavy parts to it. And, you know, shadow work is, uh, I have this Byron Katie tattoo on my feet that says, I looked the monster in the eye and found a child wanting love. And that's really all that shadow work is, you know? So when, you know, the earth passes between, when we align so that the earth is between the sun and the moon and we see the earth's shadow kind of cast on the moon and we see it getting darker and it's like the moon's getting swallowed by the shadow and then it comes out the other side and light gets restored, you know? So it takes a lot of courage to do shadow work, but it's also, you know, it's a necessary thing. Like we're meant to grow. We're meant to reevaluate. We're um, meant to let things, to let things die off and to let things slough. And we're meant to, you know, I hope that things that terrified us when we were younger, we get to reevaluate our relationship with them as we get older and realize that we're more capable than we thought, you know, or than we believed or than we were told. And that maybe things aren't as scary as to a 20 something or a 30 something or a 40 something or a 50 something or 60 you know however old we are right they weren't as scary to that as like they were when they were six but we've still been treating them as as if we were six or seven or eight you know or four or three whatever whatever the age is so this is my brain has been in like this very spacey this is also apparently in pisces and so those of us with mutable signs, and I am a uh, Pisces sun, Gemini rising, so I am a pretty mutable <laughs> sign over here. Um, it's supposed to be really affecting us, kind of this energy, and I am finding myself more spacey today. So this is going to be a little bit more of a spacey podcast, I think. But anyway, um, yeah, so shadow work. So... The other piece too, you know, the parts of us that we send to live on the edges. We live in a very death phobic and also then consequently a very alive phobic culture, generally speaking. So the parts of us that we send to live on the edges, part of the reason they feel a little scary too is that we maybe don't actually yet have the capacity for them. They're gonna challenge our ability to hold our own aliveness because our own aliveness is actually a little wild. It's a little feral. <laughs> um, it tends to have more aligned with animals than with some sort of machine. And it moves in cycles, which seems unpredictable if your culture is linear, but is actually not completely unpredictable if you're if you're able to look at things from this larger pattern, this larger cyclical or spiral pattern. So a lot of the pieces of us that we've been told are too much, those are often the pieces that we're trying to banish to the edges. And those are the pieces that when we do shadow work, we're usually trying to bring back in or tend in some way, give them the love they never got. So what does this have to do with burnout? So burnout is also a question of aliveness and capacity for aliveness. It's that 
our aliveness has been so extracted from us by us and perhaps by other people and certainly by our overculture that we end up feeling empty, right? We've also probably been doing a lot of living for other people. There's a lot of people pleasing that often goes along with burnout because usually we're, we're, yeah, we're overgiving. We're giving at the expense of ourselves. And generosity is a good thing. Generosity, where it becomes sacrifice to then even martyrdom is not necessarily a good thing. Depends on the situation, of course, but generally speaking, it's not great. <laughs> so, oftentimes the people pleasing part is a survival mechanism because we're fragmented, because we're fractured, because we on some fundamental level don't believe that we're worthy or lovable unless we are doing more or doing the right things in the right way at the right time, right? So to start to uncouple ourselves from those patterns is to have to do shadow work because then to, to, we have to reclaim those parts of ourselves that we've banished, that we've left fragmented so that we're draining energy, so that we're feeling like we need to be everything to everybody else, all of those other things. And it's also cultural. So like I said, when we live in this sort of death phobic and also then aliveness phobic culture, we actually, we lose our capacity, just like how you lose muscle if you're not using it, you know? And the good news is we can get it back. Um, you know, we can, we can build that muscle back again. We can expand our capacity to hold more of our aliveness, but it's important to talk about this, I think, because as relates to burnout, because usually when we're in that space of like burn it all down or die, our capacity is actually completely fried at that moment. So the die is actually a sign that we've been so burnt out for so long that, and we haven't been able, we haven't had any channel for aliveness and, and the slightest amount of charge to our system feels like too much and the breaker switch flips and shuts us down to keep us from actually completely burning out or actually dying, right? But then we kind of end up in this like living dead sort of situation. So we need to expand our capacity to hold more of our own aliveness so that we don't have to just die immediately in response, right? The burn it all down part is also aliveness, actually trying to, to keep us alive, trying to get us up, trying to keep us moving. And in that moment, our aliveness is coming out as rage, usually, or some kind of anger, some sort of frustration, irritation. And so in order to move that through our body in a productive way, that's also a question of capacity. But as we move it through, what comes up is usually the stuff that's underneath that, which is the grief, the loss, the feelings of betrayal, the feelings of fragmentation, the feelings of unworthiness, the feeling, the fear that we're unlovable, right? The things that we know we need to change, but we don't know how, or we're afraid to, or we're not quite ready to yet, but our soul knows that if we keep holding on to them, it'll die in some way, some fundamental way. You know, because we probably put that thing into place, whether it's a job, whether it's a relationship, we put that into place to fill the gap that the part we'd sent to live outside of us, to fill the gap that that part left, which is where codependency comes in. So if we're ready to bring that piece back home, that often means untangling from what we've had trying to fill that gap before. And that doesn't necessarily mean the relationship ends or the or the job ends or whatever, but something does have to fundamentally shift in the dynamic there. And maybe those things can make the shift with us and maybe they can't. And so there's a grief there. That's like a real, that's a very real fear. It's a very real consideration. It's a very real grief. So we don't, you know, I think we think, oh, burnout, I'm just going to rest a little bit and then I'll feel better. <laughs> and at least in my experience, it often takes a lot longer than we think it will because we have to move slowly to build our capacity up because we have to tend to the, 
to the sloughing, to the, to the releasing, um, to the honoring and the grieving and the raging and the other things along the way to those more feral parts of us that are going to probably come exploding out in some way because they haven't, they've been trying to be heard for so long and they haven't felt heard. Just like a kid. Mom, 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 mom. And then eventually you ignore them long enough and they get louder and they get louder and they get louder, right? So it's the same with these parts of us. They've been kind of like tugging on our shirts for quite a while. Hello, 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 hello. Pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. I'm right here, I'm right here, I'm right here. And it just keeps escalating from there. Why doesn't anybody listen to me? And then suddenly we're having a full on meltdown of like, yeah, I've never seen, I've never heard, I'm completely unloved. You know, I don't, I don't, maybe that's just me, <laughs> but I don't think I'm alone in that. So, yeah, so, you know, burnout, we have to, we have to understand what the process of moving out of burnout actually looks like, because we have to, we have to, on some level, be prepared to make that journey if we really want sustainable recovery from burnout and then to be in a rhythm of ongoing repair or ongoing um ongoing aliveness basically um because you know the shadow work never ends not really it it becomes less extreme has been my experience um it doesn't take as long it doesn't feel quite so dramatic we have a lot more capacity for it so it doesn't knock us nearly so off kilter but finding places in ourself that have felt unseen unvalidated unloved is an ongoing thing because there's always going to be parts of us even as adults when we quote unquote should know better shouldn't need as much like we're human we need validation right we need love we need care we need witnessing and you know, even as adults, we don't always get those in the moments that we need in the ways that we need. And so we have to, you know, we have to have processes in place. And so that's some of what, you know, I think these moments of shadow allow us to sort of think about what's lurking in our shadows that just needs a little bit of witnessing to be brought back into the light again what are we fearing you know there's a difference between wariness and fear and again neither is right or wrong inherently it's just whether we're using them appropriately and to the appropriate degree you know so there were reasons humans are somewhat afraid of the dark right we have pretty limited our senses are fairly limited in the grand scheme of apex predators. Uh, our skin is very thin. Our teeth are not that sharp. Our nails are not that sharp. We're not that fast or even comparatively that strong. So, you know, in the dark, things can come sneaking up on us a lot more, right? And I mean this like long time ago, like when we were talking about like, you know, animals when we lived in, in smaller encampments and we weren't quite as, we didn't have the big thick walls on our houses and all of that, right, in the same way. So, you know, it's okay to be wary of the dark and it's okay to have healthy amount of fear of the dark. But, you know, there's something too to going outside when the light is different or when the light is dim and... Um, you know, we're peering into the dark places and, and having the courage to do that and to be willing to be surprised that maybe the big terrifying creature that comes crawling out from behind the rock is actually a cute little kitten <laughs> or a silly little puppy or the funny cricket from Mulan or or I guess it was the dragon in Mulan, the Disney animated version, I should say. Um, yeah. Just because it's scary doesn't mean it's going to kill us, <laughs> I think is what I'm trying to say. Um, 
So yeah, so it takes courage. And when we feel like we have very little capacity, it can feel very overwhelming to think that we have to go through all of this. But that's where the creating space first, which I did that podcast episode on creating space, that's where the creating space comes in, is so that we feel like we have enough just enough spaciousness in our life to actually be able to commit to going into the dark. That's also where getting help and support comes in, right? Knowing that someone's there. There's the analogy of the pearl divers um, that I've heard. I think, um, I don't remember now what culture they were from and whether even who I heard this from even said it, acknowledged it or not, but tradition where, you know, they would sit, they would go out in pairs. One person would stay in the boat and hold, keep track of the time and the end of the rope and the other would dive down to look for pearls and the person keeping track of the time would give a tug on the rope you know and that would help the person down below know to come back up so sometimes we need someone to like hold that space for us Um, we can surrender more to the depths when someone else is holding the container when someone else is going to help bring us back up when we're when we when we need to when we're ready to and that's part of how we build capacity too because we have collective nervous systems so when we have very little capacity then you know someone else who can hold space for us who has more capacity they can share their capacity with us until we get some more of our own and that's really the benefit of that kind of stuff so yeah that's kind of my rambling thoughts on Um, shadow work and burnout (laughs) at this time of the eclipse and yeah so if you're kind of feeling like shadow work might be the place to go for you if something in this conversation um, resonated in some way and you'd want to explore what working together one-on-one might look like you're welcome to reach out I do have some availability for one-on-one folks right now Uh, If you're not so much in an acute um, burnout or shadow workplace, but you want to kind of keep exploring these types of themes, how do the archetypal mythopoetic images and, and energies of the moment of the season, kind of how they can help us find our own aliveness and give us messages and lessons. If you want to explore more of that and be in more conversations around that sanctuary, our next round of our next cohort of sanctuary is coming up. Uh, it's starting, it'll be the final Sundays of each month, September through February. And um, yeah, that's kind of what we do in that space. We gather very little agenda. There's a mix of sort of structure and unstructure, but we just connect and kind of share and tune into the energies of the season and what feels like it's moving through us as a group and as individuals and as the larger collective at the time. And then, um, You know, we use stories and myths to kind of help us explore some of those themes a little bit more and and just rest. And so particularly if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and heading into the darker part of the year and uh, it can feel like kind of the nurturing part of going into the cave um, where in the cave we're protected, things kind of can't come out at us from all angles. We might have a a little fire, just enough light to kind of sit and be warm and, and be together by. So it'll be that kind of a vibe. So anyway, you'd be most welcome to join us if that speaks to you. So I'll have more information about that. I can put the link in my show notes. You can find it on my website. And um, yeah, if you know somebody else who's kind of been curious about what shadow work means, or if you really liked this, my reflections, my rambling reflections on shadow work, and particularly as it relates to burnout, you know, please, by all means, share it um, with somebody who you think might also appreciate it. It just, yeah, it helps these conversations move out into the world and ripple out in different ways which is what I hope for so all right well be well be kind to yourself in this time do your best to be kind to others um, through being kind to yourself and yeah and just give yourself some grace if, if the shadows are coming up and if you need some more rest or you feel a little more tired or if you're really kind of aware of your of a limited capacity right now so it'll pass <laughs> and uh especially if we're kind of able to engage with this in cycles rather than sort of this pendulum linear like now i'm here and the only way to go is back over there you know and then now i'm back over there and then now i'm back over there you know we want to kind of get off that seesaw um and and get into a spiral path where there can actually be some growth and some shift and some movement so 
yeah, many, many blessings for this time and I will see you next time.